1969, Alex Webster became head coach of the New York Giants. The Giants did not have a winning year, but they finished the season with all the fight and fury of a rumbling, wrecking avalanche as they buried three opponents in a row. The Pittsburgh Steelers, the St. Louis Cardinals, and the Cleveland Browns. And with those wins, Giants fans mollified themselves in the offseason. They talked with knowing smiles. They anticipated. And if they could not brag and holler, they could at least swagger a bit and proclaim in all sincerity that the Giants would be near unbeatable in 1970. 1970 dawned and the fans filled venerable Yankee Stadium to the rafters, hoping the legacy of 1969 would prove them right in their great expectations. Hoping that perhaps people would long remember the 1970 New York football Giants. The New York season opened with a night game and with the Chicago Bears as the intended victim. But despite an early lead, an untimely breakdown left the Giants victimized and the loss left the promise of 1969 somewhat tarnished. In Dallas, the Giants fared no better, and a pattern had begun as another lead was bobbled and blown away. In New Orleans, the Giants clicked to life, only to click off moments later. Ron Johnson scored once, but was then denied. New York had to settle for a field goal and a 10-point lead. But for them, a lead was poison, and they soon found the antidote, give it to the enemy. And while one play doesn't make a season, this one came close. Aaron Thomas was called out of bounds on what should have been the winning touchdown. The Giants left New Orleans with three losses, no wins. The legacy of 1969 was shattered and lost in a triumvirate of defeats. Shattered by mistakes. Lost as the offense floundered and sputtered. shattered and lost because the breaks have been so near and yet so far. And as the losses mounted, the question echoed. Could the Giants become a winner? a team of pickpockets at work. They're so slick, many victims never realize they've been robbed. Watch again. This is one way a million travelers will lose their money this year. Protect your money. Instead of cash, carry American Express traveler's checks. If they're stolen or lost, you can get them promptly replaced. American Express traveler's checks. Because it could happen to you. After the Saints, New York met the Philadelphia Eagles, who were also winless. Although it was billed as a battle for last place, the Eagles looked like anything but a loser as they firebombed the Giants from the outset. But safety Spider Lockhart shut down the Eagles' attack, and the Giants had found their beginning. A spark was struck. The spark flamed as Bobby Duhon returned an Eagle punt for a touchdown. The flame became a holocaust as Ron Johnson erupted. A solar flare, a streak of fire flashing behind mow the man down blocking of Willie Young, Greg Larson, and Dick Buzzard. 
and where once stood Eagle defenders Pete Case and Doug Van Horn blasted gaping holes and Ron Johnson poured through. For a moment, his superlative efforts seemed wasted when this 89-yard touchdown was called back. But with time fleeting and with the Giants' first win hanging in the balance, the runner in royal blue did it again. And not only did Ron Johnson's run mean victory, but it was a catalyst the first element in a team building process that continued the following week in Boston against the Patriots and their spanking new quarterback, Joe Cap. For Cap, it was a day when his best laid plans were put to rest beneath a withering defensive charge. Suddenly, the Giants' D was everywhere. Suddenly, another team element was added, another piece in the puzzle. Patriot fans were less than excited by their new hero. But Fran Tarkenton to Clifton McNeil excited Giants fans and put the finishing touches on a 16 to nothing New York win. At home, the fans welcomed their shutout supermen and the Cardinals glamorous ground game was ground to a halt. And St. Louis became the victims of New York's latest team element. After five games, Fran Tarkenton and his receivers had put it all together. Number 38, Bob Tucker, made his scoring debut with two touchdowns. But it was Fran Tarkenton who was applauded the loudest. He had returned home in triumph. The New York Jets were next, and the trophy was the biggest ever. New York City for a year. Although Kathy and Joanne thought the Jets were still number one, after this game, they weren't even number one in New York. The Giants' defense hounded and pounced, crowded and crumpled and came hungry for quarterback. Jim Files and Fred Dreyer performed the ultimate in defense as they toppled the Jets in their own end zone. While Al didn't have much to show, Francis and his receivers did. And the latest link in the forged chain of teamwork rolled the Jets' secondary up and blew it away as Tucker and McNeil flew fast and free. And while many people had written the Giants off after their early losses, those people were now taking a second look because at four and three, the Giants were rising fast. When Dallas came to town to test the Giants' four-game win streak, they were unimpressed as they took an early lead. Only Pete Gogolak's field goals, this a club record of 54 yards, kept New York in the game. But in the second half, the Giants' defense became a blue tidal wave, throwing back the Cowboys' running game and drowning the passing game. While Dallas was drying out, Ron Johnson scorched through and around the Cowboys line like an infuriating dust devil.
Johnson's 140 yards rushing was frustrating to Dallas coach Tom Landry. But when Landry defensed the run, Johnson broke the Cowboys as a receiver, making the final 23-20 New York. Another big win in the victory chain, now at five. The Giants' fortunes were flying high, and when the Redskins visited Yankee Stadium, they found that even the Giants' mistakes weren't hurting them. Although the Redskins took a commanding lead with three third period touchdowns, they were not ready for yet another blossoming element in the Giants team framework. Number 24, running back Tucker Fredrickson, emerged from the shadows and burst into prominence. He rampaged for 10 receptions and scored twice. With the Giants trailing 33-21 late in the last quarter, Tucker Fredrickson streamed down the sidelines and into the end zone. All units were functioning together and the defense held to regain possession. When faced with the fourth and six, things looked futile. But to the Giants, the word futile had become meaningless. Tarkenton to Johnson got the first down. Then with one minute to go, Ron Johnson swooped in a victorious war eagle. And the Giants had won six in a row and were nearing the top of the division. Next was Crystal Cold Philadelphia and a national TV audience. The Giants took an early lead as they continued to play self-assured, take-your-break football. But then, disaster struck. Not only costly on the scoreboard, but costly because it halted momentum and costly because it gave hope to the Eagles and their attack turned ferocious. Though the night was clear and the ball went spinning, it just kept on tumbling down. The Giants' last-ditch effort failed. The clock struck midnight, the spell was broken. The six-game win streak had ended. And word was that this upset loss on national TV would give the Giants an excuse to fold up their tents and creep silently out into the night and out of the division race. The Giants had gone through the fire of defeat. Perhaps it had tempered them like steel. 
In Washington, Sonny Jurgensen's rifle arm was right on. But cornerback Willie Williams came up with the silencer. And the Giants were on their way again. And still the Redskins couldn't cope with Tucker Fredrickson, who scored twice. Fran to Bob Tucker accounted for the tie maker. Then with time on the wane, Bobby Duhon barged downfield to set up the tie-breaking Pete Gogolak field goal that put the Giants back in the victory circle and back in the thick of the division race. Next, the Bills came to Yankee Stadium, and after the amenities, they never knew what hit them, as Bills quarterback Dennis Shaw became part of the landscape. The offense made it a clean sweep of their AFC opponents and eight wins in their last nine games, which made it showdown time in St. Louis, where a win could put them into first place in the NFC East. The outcome was never in doubt, as Fran Tarkenton let loose a natural phenomenon, a hailstorm of passes that left the Cardinals bewitched, bothered, and thoroughly beaten. When the route was over, the Giants emerged as division leaders, tied with Dallas. But a win in their last game over the powerful Rams would give them sole possession of the NFC East title. The Giants were now down to the big one. They started well. Behind the blocking of Willie Young and Charlie Harper, Ron Johnson ripped through the Rams' tough front four to become the first Giant ever to rush for over 1,000 yards in a season. His rushing set up the field goal that put New York ahead three to nothing. But from that point on, the Giants' dream of a title crumbled to dust. While the Giants went one way, the Brakes went another. Misfortune upon misfortune was epitomized by an injury to Jerry Shea, whose leg was broken in five places early in the game. The second half was worse. The Rams front four pursued and pulverized Fran Tarkenton. And when number 11, Dick Shiner came in, his luck was little better. then it was over. And as they left the field, the Giants must have thought of the many little things that could have gone their way throughout the year to make it their season. They must also have thought of the ovation they received as New York fans poured out their love for their team. This group of men who started in September as individuals and finished in December as much more than that. Men like number 43, Spider Lockhart, the defensive captain whose talent speaks for itself, but whose real value is the experience he lends to young ball hawking toughs like number 44, safety man Tom Longo. Men like number 41, cornerback Willie Williams, who led the team in interceptions. Cornerback Scott Eaton was injured for part of the season, but when he was healthy, opponents knew it. When he wasn't, rookie Kenny Parker stepped in and put down some D. 
Outside linebacker Matt Hazeltine is considered one of the most aggressive men in the game. And he's been that way for 15 years. On the other side, number 55, Ralph Heck, complimented Hazeltine perfectly. But the real bonanza was rookie middle linebacker Jim Files, number 58, who tracked the ball or the man with equal effectiveness. As Jim got more games under his belt, opponents found that this was one rookie who hit a ton. Number 73, Jim Kanicki, who came from the Browns and did all that was expected of him. He crushed people. 71, defensive end Bob Lertzema has moves that become more polished each season. But polish is not his bag. He likes to put people in the dirt. 75, Jerry Shea stood his man up straight and then put him down hard. The mainstay of the front four was number 89, Fred Dreyer. Speed, second effort, agility, and the wise quarterback never counts him out of the play. He powered over all pros, like the Dallas Cowboys' Ralph Neely. But his real game was played with the tooth-jarring, spleen-bruising abandon of a one-man stampede. At season's end, the Giants showed promise of becoming the fiercest hitters in the league. While the defense played with abandon, the special teams played with unabashed ferocity. Men like John Kirby, Joe Green, and Pat Hughes made frequent sacrifices of opponents' bodies. Number 25, Les Shy, was the league's fourth leading kickoff return man. But no matter what the job, the special teams found a way to search out their own special reason for being. The thrill of hitting. Some credit cards may get you a hotel room. The American Express money card can buy you the presidential suite at the Waldorf Astoria in New York. The American Express money card can buy you a second honeymoon at the Georges Sank in Paris. Plus everything else from airfare to meals to rent a cars. I strongly recommend you apply for the American Express money card for people who travel. Once again, the Giants' offense was led by quarterback Fran Tarkenton. And although Fran occasionally came up with a surprise, one thing remained constant. No pressure bent him. He performed with coolness, controlled audacity, Broken plays were turned into solid gains. Mistakes were shrugged away. Recovery was smooth. Ice water flowed where there should have been blood. Fran Tarkenton, a little older, a little wiser, sometimes a little more cautious. But still, Fran the scrambler, the gutty gambler. Fran has learned that while the safety of a scrambler is not guaranteed, pain is. From the wisdom of experience, he's found ways to avoid the pain. 
Get the first down and drop out. Get 10 and get down. A good gain in submarine. And if it's not always easy to find a safe haven, persistence will out. And the scrambler will survive to run again. As the NFC's third leading passer, Fran had help from his great new receivers, number 18, Clifton McNeil, and number 38, Bob Tucker. Don Herman, in his second year, was still leaping and showing good hands. Number 84, Dick Houston, had the speed to get open and the speed to go. But in 1970, it was the man in the blue shoes who stole the show. Ron Johnson was superb as a receiver, catching 48 passes. But when he came out of the backfield as a runner, he became a whole picking, dust kicking blur of blue. Ron Johnson, member of the 1,000-yard club. A swivel hip faker, a six-point maker. An outstanding player, to say the least, but only one of 40. One part of the organism whose sinew and soul was held together by Coach Alex Webster. He molded his men into a team and was honored for the job he did as NFC Coach of the Year. So, we are the New York Giants, individuals and professionals, but more. We became a team, more than a group of men who get their picture taken together. We shared nine victories, five defeats, exultation, and depression. We strove for a common goal and failed by a slim margin. And in 1971, when we looked back from a title, We'll know where we had our beginnings. We'll know that 1970 was the making of a team. Last 1970 was a year of achievement and growth. A season in which head coach Alex Webster saw the development of a football team. The Giants' 9-5 record was due in large part to a short-up defense anchored by a tough rookie from Oklahoma, number 58, Jim Files. While Yankee Stadium echoed with the crack and pop of the defense, Fun City was lit up by the electric charges of newcomer Ron Johnson, number 30. In only his second year as a pro, Johnson gave the Giants a breakaway threat previously absent from their attack. He darted, he danced, and he tore through tacklers to become the first Giant runner ever to exceed the magic 1,000-yard mark and he was named to the All-Pro team. With the addition of Johnson and the emergence of gifted young receivers like Bob Tucker, number 38, and Don Herman, number 85, 
the Giants' offense became a freewheeling carousel of excitement that turned on fans from Bayonne to Brooklyn. In 1970, the Giants became a proven football team and stoked the fires of optimism that marked the opening of the 1971 season. But the first sight to greet Alex Webster was Ron Johnson in street clothes. Johnson had suffered a knee injury during the preseason and was an omen of things to come. The tough man against man battles in the NFL would claim many victims. Before the season was over, the Giants roster was decimated by injuries and as many as eight starters were out at one time. 1971 would be a year of pain and frustration, a season that would severely test the long and proud tradition of the New York Giants. But the winning spirit that has guided the Giants since their beginning would survive, and the team would see the development of new players who will carry on the proud heritage of the New York Giants. The season began with a Sunday shootout with the arch rival Green Bay Packers and the game immediately revealed its high scoring character as Green Bay's Ken Ellis streaked 100 yards with a missed field goal.